in fact, some HGB educators have been let go because um, they do not have the necessary finances to support these HGB um, teachers. And what impact has that had on our substitute teachers then um, to see to it that teaching and learning takes place where there are no um, teachers? Uh, my second question is about um, the dropout rate that we extensively discussed. Now, it shows that um, in the grade six alone, you have a, predict, a projected amount of 52,090 grade seven learners. And in grade 12, there's a projection of about 23,362 um, grade 12 learners that you are projecting to drop out. Now, uh, my question is, what support mechanisms are in place by the department to ensure that we are reaching out to these learners? Um, in communities, especially in rural areas, how are we reaching out to them to return to schools and have um, schools been equipped to reach out to those learners? And where um, schools need counselors as support, what are we doing to equip um, teachers to do that counseling? Because as we know, there are not many social workers available. And again, how is the Department of Education and um, Social Development working to ensure that learners don't get lost in the transition from home to school? Um, it's just a background noise. Uh, sorry, Chairperson, I can't hear myself. Um, can, can just a little bit. Can members switch on their videos when they speak? When you speak, switch on your videos. I know that it has an impact on the on the reception sometimes, but if your reception is good, please switch on your 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 video when you when you engage. Thank you. Um thank you, Chairperson. I hope that um I've got two pictures there now. <laughs> um I don't know what's wrong with my teams, but there my video is on. Um, so I've spoken a little about the dropout rates, uh, Chairperson, that I'm concerned about how we're mitigating that, and I'm speaking about the substitute and assistant teachers. My third question is similar to yours, Chairperson, where the issue of uh, PPC provisions to schools. Now, it's been in the media, there's been gross fraudulent activities. What is the department's view as far as schools are concerned, as far as um, educational institutions are concerned? Is the department happy with the rollout of the PPEs? Of the PPEs? And then where the curriculums are not completed, is the department confident that where they are not completed and uh, curriculums are being rolled over to the following year, um, will the teachers be able to cope with the workload come 2021. And then lastly, as an NCOP member for the Northern Cape, I have a few very direct uh, Northern Cape questions. Now it has come to our attention that in the Northern Cape, um, there has been incubation camps. One of the incubation camps is at the Van der Kloof Dam. Now um, there are 155 learners who were taken to the camp, um, grade 12 learners. Now, does the Department of Education know anything about these camps? Are we ensured that these learners are safe at these camps in 55 learners at one camp? Are we ensured that protocols are being observed, protocols such as um, social distancing? Have they ensured that there are sufficient masks, that there is distancing when these children are um, sleeping at night, etc.? Um, I just want a little bit more information on that. And then I'm also particularly concerned about the Northern Cape's reporting. The Northern Cape has not reported um, on um, the district quality, the quality of the PPEs in the Northern Cape. Why is that? They may, have also. May you, may, you, may, you, may you summarize your questions, ma'am? We have some few minutes left. We'll need answers to those questions. Okay, uh, Chairperson. Lastly, yes. lastly, the Northern Cape has also not reported on the projected learner dropout. So this essentially means that they have no plans to mitigate this problem in the Northern Cape to ensure assistance uh, that these learners actually return to schools. Thank you very much, Chairperson. I would also like to ask a question, Chair. 
it's a network um, um thanks that's honorable um Lutuli. Uh, thank you, Chairperson, and greeting to everyone. Um, in Honorable Christian has uh, covered me in some few questions that I wanted to ask. But uh, Chairperson, um, I would like to know from the department what will happen to to the grades, especially. I'm, I'm speaking from experience because I've been speaking to a lot of parents. Uh, there are parents that still haven't took their kids back to school, especially those who are doing grade R, grade one, grade two because they are too anxious, they, they, they think that it's not safe. So my question is, will those kids repeat the grades, especially the grade R's, because we're looking at other kids that will come to the school next year to do the grade R's. So what will happen to those that I did not return to school? And also, um, I remember when, when, when we spoke to the department last time, they promised that each child will receive two masks um, but uh, those who have returned to school at the later stage, the, the other grades, except grade seven and grade 12, they've been receiving one mask and um, they they attend schools three, three, three times a week. So it makes it difficult for parents to make sure that the masks are clean because they only received one. But if maybe we, we did stick to what the department said that each child will receive two masks, then it will make their lives easier. Thank you. Uh, question, Chairperson? Yes, sir. Thank you, thank you, Chairperson. Let me welcome the report and uh, the information provided by the department. Um, I think that uh, it goes a long way in uh, trying to respond to the many, many, many issues that, uh, that uh, um, confronting us. Chairperson, but I have a, a few questions. Um, my first question is, um, in terms of, of, of the numbers um, of uh, the kids coming back to school, um, what are the reasons that um, some kids are not coming back, but also are not uh, enrolled in any private uh, institutions? Secondly, Chairperson, I think the Northern Cape question has been asked by um, um, by the speaker before me. Um, I, I want to, to check, Chairperson, that uh, there they are teachers that um, are, you know, are not have not come back because of comorbidities. Um, what is what is the situation now in terms of replacing some of the teachers? Um, where in because I could see that there's quite huge numbers um, between those that came back and those that did not. And, and so how is the department handling that and, and how is it going to, to resolve it? Um, the other question, Chairperson, is on the, it's on the, let me see, yes, on the university. Um, I want to check that um, given the fact that there are ties nowadays that have been reworked um, as of early next year in terms of marking and results being resolved, is there a, a conversation that is taking place between um, the education levels to ensure that uh, the universities will still be open for matriculants who will get their results in March and so on after their papers have been uh, marked and so on. So, so um, is there a, a kind of working relationship there of that kind of six to, to address it? And the last one, Chairperson, is on the disruptions that have happened across the different schools. Um, or, you know, either by whoever who feels that is not happy with how things were done um, in the hype of, of uh, the, the disease that we are dealing with. Um, is that now sorted or are there still issues in some areas where that, that need to be dealt with in order for uh, schooling to um, go smoothly as predicted? 
Thank you, Chairperson, but I welcome the report. Thank you so much. Yeah, other members, anyone who wants to take a bite? <clears throat> Chair, can I be excused? I need to go to the NA. I'm answering questions. Oh, okay, no, you are excused. Um, if, if there are questions that may need your, um, your, 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 your intervention, we'll, we'll, we'll do them in writing, if there is any of those that cannot be answered by the team you left behind. And no, thanks so much, Chair, and thanks to the committee for giving us the chance to engage. No, thanks a lot for, you know, for being you. Thanks a lot. Thanks, for Chair. giving your time to us, for, for our children. Thanks a million. Um, yeah, are there other questions that members would like to, points of clarity and other questions? I've already said that some of the questions that may need the minister to answer will will refer them in to the minister in writing. The DGC, they may even also help in answering all the questions that are asked. And and the fact that this presentation is informed by the questions that we asked the department. This is a response and a brief on what happened between the last time we met and now. Actually, even more importantly, this um, this level that we are in is the first time that we are having a meeting under under uh, under uh, 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 level two and yeah and the new restrictions as relaxed. Thank you. Are there further questions from members? If there is none, um, we may, let's say for instance, check with the, if there are some answers that um, your team would like to give a DG. The, I'm also worried about this thing of disruptions of schools and and of course, we have talked to some of the impacts of the disruption. Um, under normal circumstances, if a child stays away from school for for two days, when the child go back to school after those two days of being ill, they actually take a long time to recover the the time that they have lost at school. Now imagine this period that we have. Uh, you know that we have uh, we are forced to go to go under these conditions that uh, the levels have actually dropped tremendously. I guess so, and it's also good to hear that there is a plan, you know, on to pick up to 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 pick up this. But at the same time, for the plan to to pass, the parents must also put their hands in, you know, put hands on deck. Um, if there are no further questions and comments from members, I'll give over to DG and the team to to answer the questions, to comment, and then we close. Thank you the... very much. Uh, I hope I'm audible. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Let, let me start with the comments that you made, Chair. Uh, the first one was uh, around funds that were allocated for COVID-19 essentials. What we have presented to your Honorable Committee Chair is the findings of the Auditor General, uh, interim <coughs> audit. The President requested uh, the Auditor General to prioritize auditing all procurement done on COVID essentials in all mm. departments. And what we have presented, which is the last part of the presentation, the two to three slides that we shared with you. Yeah. yeah. The second committee. I've checked, there's no other committee that has received the interim report of the AG. You are the second one from the uh, portfolio committee. And the other committees, the report is going to be completed only end of September, the first part of the interim report. And it will be tabled in uh, committees of parliament. The last part of the report is going to be tabled in November. 
Now, alongside the work of the Auditor General, the President has also identified departments which must be investigated by the Special Investigation Unit, the SIU. So education is one of those departments. Our department was visited by the SIU to come and satisfy themselves whether the 600 million which was set aside for water and sanitation, nothing was uh, diverted to anything else other than water and sanitation. We're given a number of questions to answer. Uh, Mr. Van der Westeisen, who is the head of infrastructure, had two sessions with the SIU. We are still waiting for the SIU to give their report. They are now busy in the provinces. They are doing these investigations. And as soon as there's anything available, Chair, like we have done with the interim report of the Auditor General, we will advise you whether it is appropriate for you, uh, for us to come and share information with you, or whether you could get it from those agencies. That's, that's the first uh, uh, point that you had raised. Your comments are spot on about uh, disruptions in schools. They are not only academically costly, but uh, uh, disruptions in schools can also be monetarily costly because some of the learners might have to, to repeat, which means that taxpayers might have to pay more than once for a, for a learner in, in, in one grade. So they are both academically costly and uh, from monetary perspective, they are also very costly. And some of them are motivated, are, are, are carried out on political motives. There has been political organizations that were involved in disrupting learning and teaching. Some parents, out of lack of knowledge, did that, but we've made an effort to communicate with parents to say, you have five options which we have shared with you in this presentation. Uh, one, of, one of those options is that if you feel that you don't want to take your child to school, you are at liberty to do so. But you have to put up with the consequences that uh, accrue from that decision. And one of the consequences which the honorable member raised is that those learners will have to repeat next year. Certainly so, because for the first quarter of the academic year, Chair, if you remember, schools closed in March, just mm. before the lockdown on the 26th of March, when we had completed the first quarter of the school calendar year. It mm. means the work that that learner would done for three months for 2020 goes down the drain if the learner does not go back to school. Mm. Even if we would not be able to continue now for learners who have gone back to school, we are going to take the work that they did in the first quarter, combine it with the work that they have done and determine whether they go to the next grade or not. Mm. Mm. And that, that is what we are trying to communicate to parents which at times uh, they understand, at times they don't seem to understand. Let me then get to Honorable Christian's uh, questions. The first one was uh, a substitute post. Indeed, because we started with grade 12 and grade 7, we didn't have the pressure of making sure that all substitutes are in place because you could use other teachers who are there whose grades were still coming for gaps where some of the substitute teachers were not at work. Now that all grades are back, the pressure is on the system to make sure that all teachers, are, uh, teachers with comorbidities or substitute posts are filled. Number one, the substitute uh, 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 posts are limited and uh, Teachers with comorbidities, we've never dealt with that before. The substitute pool of posts would be based on our historical numbers. And now COVID-19 has even increased that uh, 10 or 100 fold, which makes it extremely difficult. That's why we are beginning to talk about 
teacher assistance or education assistance because we will not be able to fully pay a, a teacher would uh, uh, substitute uh, a teacher with comorbidities at the same level of salary and so on. So we are bringing assistance who will work with teachers who are at home um, and making sure that learners are fully occupied, uh, supervised learners in the classroom, which is what uh, provinces have started to do. But this is this place, uh, this place, uh, a, a huge finance, financial strain on provinces. Some provinces are actually battling to cope with this because they didn't budget for this. They didn't receive additional money. Instead, uh, budgets have been cut and it makes their task very difficult to fully replace all, all teachers. SGB posts the little, the little uh, advantage with that is that uh, it's in quintile four and quintile five. And usually SGB posts would help the school to have a favorable learner-teacher ratio. And now that uh, schools will not have this uh, SGB post, it means that the learner-teacher ratio is going to go up. But we are looking at ways of supporting schools uh, so that they really don't collapse. Um, I've spoken to uh, how we deal with replacements, we are monitoring that on a weekly basis when we meet with provinces. Uh, possible dropout of learners who are not returning to schools. Well, we are also monitoring that so that we begin to plan, even for learners who might come in numbers next year who had not returned this year for uh, repeating the grades that they were supposed to do this year. So that's why we are collecting this information to monitor those figures. Issue of counseling. We do not want to burden teachers to do counseling to learners. Uh, there's a lot that they need to do in terms of covering the curriculum. We are using our specialists who are there, uh, but we are also using life orientation teachers whose responsibility among others would also fall within that purview of being able to provide some support and counseling to learners. But we are using NGOs, uh, um, we are using universities who are assisting schools, but in addition to that, we use faith-based organization. You'll be amazed of the capacity that you'd find within faith-based organizations in terms of trauma counseling, uh, to learners and even to teachers. So we're using them as well. In complete curriculum, we are looking at a three-year uh, arrangement of uh, curriculum recovery, but we are also monitoring curriculum recovery this year and will continue. We are going to strengthen the monitoring of curriculum recovery going. Mrs. Weston is part of this meeting. She can also add uh, if there's a need to do so. And we are also monitoring this in this one-on-one -on -one meetings that we have with provinces every week. And then the issue of uh, incubation camps. I had a discussion with Mr. Parazzi around incubation camps. We've also spoken about incubation camps in the committee of HODs. We actually discourage them and we say they could be allowed to run provided, as Honorable Christian has said, health, safety, and social distancing requirements are fully met, no compromise. Otherwise, they should not continue. So that is understood by all the nine provinces. Uh, Northern Cape has not reported on the quality of PP. Yes, we still have a meeting with them. We'll be seeing them either tomorrow or Friday. We'll follow up all of these things where there are gaps in their reports. That's the purpose of uh, meeting with them every week uh, to follow up on some of these things, um, including where they have not reported on the dropout rate. Honorable Lutuli, will uh, learners who have not gone back to school uh, uh, be required to repeat? Yes, ma'am. Uh, they will have to repeat, unfortunately, those who would have not returned, and which will be a waste, as I have explained, a waste of one year in their lives.
uh, have learners received uh, the required number of masks. Uh, we are following this up with provinces. We'll appreciate if you could also give us details in case you know of any school or any province so that we follow up and make sure that uh, the directions are very clear. Every learner, every educator, non-teaching staff must receive two masks. That's what the directions are saying, nothing less than two masks. Honorable Baha, uh, uh, what are the reasons for uh, learners who are not uh, returned to schools? Well, the uh, honorable member, uh, one, one, one uh, honorable member uh, referred to these reasons. It's mainly out of fear and anxiety, fear for infections, fear for their learners to die, despite the fact that the uh, medical evidence and the scientific evidence that is there indicates that uh, very few learners, uh, you know, die out of, uh, you know, the COVID-19. So, but the main reason is it's really fear, as I can say. Um, have learners received, no, this one is it's covered already, replacement of teachers with comorbidities. I've indicated that there are instances where provinces have done that. Uh, there are those that are still lagging behind that are in the process of doing that. And part of the weekly meetings is to follow them up and make sure that they replace these teachers. Conversation with universities, yes, indeed. We met with the Forum of Universities on the 24th uh, last week. We had very good discussions with them. We are even Universities are also coming and they'll start uh, admitting learners around. So the release of our results is well in line with the plans of the universities. And we are also meeting with assessment bodies to coordinate the release of the results. So it's compromised or disadvantaged. <clears throat> and um, are, are, are we still experiencing disruption? or whether have we address all issues that related to disruptions. As I said, some of the disruptions were politically motivated. Some of them were because of lack of information. We have tried to address that with parents because some school governing bodies were also disrupting schools. Some communities were also disrupting schools. Part of the presentation indicated that uh, the QLTC is up and running. In eight out of nine provinces in the Western Cape have indicated that to get them to understand what the department has done and appreciate that learners are not really vulnerable uh, from uh, the virus uh, COVID-19. Uh, Honorable Chair, if you allow me, I'm going to request uh, one or two colleagues uh, maybe to add uh, uh, Mrs. Weston on the issue of the curriculum, please, if you want to uh, add and Dr. Whittle and uh, uh, Ms. Gaya on anything that requires, uh, you know, uh, additional comment or response. Mrs. Weston. Uh, good afternoon, honorable <laughs> members. Uh, no, DG, I, you've covered and explained You've covered and explained the, the plan for curriculum recovery. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Whittle? DJ, the same with me. I think you've dealt very adequately with the psychosocial support issues. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Whittle. Mrs. Gaya, and thank you for presenting. <laughs> thank you, DJ. I'm trying my best. Um, I don't have any questions. Yeah, yeah, Simone. Yes, TG, can you hear me? Okay, thank you. I, I don't have any questions. Now. Thank you, DG. Thank no you. questions from my side. Thank you, sister. Uh, Chair, we are done from our part. Uh, that's the response from the department and for our pledge and the opportunity to present to you an Engage the report as you correctly pointed out on issues that uh, 
you listed and said we must come and present to you uh, about. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, thank you, DG. Um, let me thank the members and your team for for having stayed for these three hours in the meeting. Um, if there are issues that members feel strongly that they were not given adequate answers, um, they can run that with a OSIS Noltando, and then the answers definitely will be will be sent to us in writing or to those to the members who have asked the questions. Um, thank you very much. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you, bye. Bye. Bye, thank you.